Well, good morning. Welcome to Vaughn Forest Church. If we haven't had a chance to meet, my name's Adam, one of the pastors here. Glad you are here for the conclusion of our Financial Freedom teaching series. We've been in this series for five weeks. If you're just jumping in, if you're new, if you're a guest, welcome. We are so glad you're here. Way back when, when we started this series, we said that we are taking five weeks to talk about money for a few reasons. First, we said because stewardship is discipleship. We don't believe we're the owners. We believe God owns everything. He entrusts some of it to us, and we are simply the stewards. We are the managers. And part of how we steward financial resources is a part of our discipleship, a part of our spiritual growth. And so, yes, this series has been about money, but it's also been about how we grow closer to God. The second reason we said we wanted to take five weeks is because Jesus talked about money a lot. He talked about money more than heaven and hell combined. He talked about money more than faith. He talked about money more than prayer. Last Sunday, we actually took a look at one of Jesus's most famous parables about money. And then finally, the last reason we said was just the practical nature, that for most of us, finances aren't associated with freedom. They're associated with stress, and there's lots of debt, and, and it can create a lot of tension. In fact, money is the number one reason uh, listed that marriages go through a divorce. And so a lot of good things have happened in this series. Many of you have taken significant next steps in your walk with the Lord in this series. And there's a lot to celebrate. And we had uh, 57 families a few weeks ago take the four-month tithe challenge. And so they're kind of off and running with that. That's something to celebrate. We had a new life group launch, a financial peace life group during this series. We celebrate that. Many of you attended the budgeting workshop that we had here a couple of weeks ago. We gave away $1,000 in both of our services a few weeks ago to pay down debt. And if you've missed any of the messages in this series, it's a reminder that we preach in series, not just sermons. They're all kind of tied together. So I would encourage you to go back through and listen or watch when you catch some free time because God has done a lot of things in this series and I'm excited for so many of you and the steps that you've taken. But what I want to do today is really kind of wrap this series up with a perspective that I hope will stick with us for the long haul. And so the title of today's message is An Eternal View of Money. An Eternal View of Money. And this idea of eternity. Like sometimes we take for granted that the idea of eternity, it really kind of comes from our Christian faith. It's really one of the prominent teachings in the New Testament. And this idea that you can actually experience eternal life. I mean, maybe you're in church for the first time in years. Maybe you haven't picked up a Bible in years. I'm glad you're here. Even if that's the case, you've probably heard the most famous verse from the entire Bible, John 3, 16. What, what does Jesus say? For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have what? Eternal life. That eternal life is offered to us through Jesus Christ, not of anything that we do in our own merit, but because of what Jesus did for us. And when we accept Jesus Christ into our life as our personal Lord and Savior, the promise of Scripture, the promise from our Savior is that we have eternal life. What does that mean? What that means is that when you die, if you're a follower of Jesus, you leave this life, you enter immediately into eternity. The Bible says we spend one of two places in eternity. Heaven, if we're a follower of Jesus, unfortunately. If not, hell. But eternity is a real thing, and it's prominent, and it's a part of our faith. And eternity affects all of how we look at life, including money. And so let me give you a big idea that I want you to jot down if you're taking notes this morning, and then we're gonna spend the rest of our time together unpacking that. Here it is. In your notes, life is short, eternity is long, money affects both. That's about as succinct a way as I could state it, okay? Life is short. The time we have on earth is short in comparison to the time that we will spend in eternity. You ever try to think about eternity like that it'll never end? Let me give you a headache, right? So life is short, eternity is long, and here's the thing, money affects both. What does that mean? How we use money while we are here living this life on this earth, it affects our life on this earth. I hope that's something that you've seen in this series. But also, how we choose to steward the money that we've been entrusted with while we're here on this earth, it will also affect things for all eternity. And I recently came across a video that I felt really illustrated this well, all right? So I want you to take a look at this video, and then we'll jump back into our notes. So take a look. You and I can expect to spend 70 to 80 years living on earth. That's truly not very long compared to the timeline of eternity. And as Christians, we know we are called to make the most of our time to reach people for Christ. 
but have you ever thought about what kind of Christian legacy you will leave behind for your family and future generations? At times, we can get a little off track, chasing after the things of this world, make more money, buy more stuff, and be more comfortable. We worked hard for it, so we think it's all ours. But is that what the Bible teaches us? Scripture like Psalm 24.1 make it very clear that God is the creator of everything and the owner of everything. But the story does not stop there. In the book of Matthew, Jesus commands us to wisely use everything he has given to us. When we understand that everything belongs to God and that we are asked to manage it for his glory, ownership ends and legacy giving begins. We see all that we have as gifts, not possessions. We realize we are managers, not owners. So every way we spend our money, use our time, deploy our talents is full of powerful kingdom growing potential. What if everyone started looking at everything they have as belonging to God and not themselves? How could that impact the church? How could that impact the world? For most of us, the biggest opportunity we have to be good managers of what God has entrusted to us comes when we die. But we can prepare for that moment today Today, we can choose to make a legacy giving plan that honors not only our family, but also the one who gave it all to us in the first place. Maybe God is calling you to continue giving to your church or to ministries you love, serve, and support, even after you leave this earth, all to be used by Him to reach a world that desperately needs Christ. What would happen if we loosen our grip on the things of this world and learn to give back to God with an open hand, both during and beyond our lifetime? But how do you do this? And where do you start? That's where we can help. We can help you create a legacy giving plan that lives well beyond your life here on earth. And what is the result? The result of all of this is Christians who are choosing to use their time, passions, and money with a focus on God. Through legacy giving, Christians are sowing seeds that will bear real kingdom fruit and have an impact into eternity. So I really like the way that video captures the idea. I like the language they use too, a legacy giving plan, because it's a reminder, like when we give, that leaves a legacy for now, and when we give, it leaves a legacy for when we're gone. So here's what we're gonna do in our notes today. The notes are a little different, and this is gonna require like maybe looking at them uh, in a way that we usually don't look at our notes. I've got four statements that I'm gonna walk through today, and two of the statements concern our life on this side of eternity, Okay. So part of the challenge of this message is to see the entirety of your life as the entirety of your life, meaning your life here on earth, your life in heaven for all eternity. So the first two statements concern our life on this side of eternity, our life while we're here on earth. And then the last two statements concern our life once we enter eternity, once we are actually physically present with Jesus. And hopefully through all of those statements together, they help us take an eternal view of money. So here's the first one I want to ask you to jot down. On this side of eternity, we can provide for our families with eternity in mind. On this side of eternity, okay? We haven't talked about that in this series. That one of the reasons God allows money to come into our possession is so that we can take care of our families, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with providing for your families, planning for your families. Future. In fact, there's a pretty strong uh, language that Paul uses to Timothy in one of his letters about the consequences of not taking care of our families. So let me read this first to you, 1 Timothy 5, 8. Paul says, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So this is part of how we live out our faith is that we earn and we take care of our families. And this can be challenging from time to time. I mean, it used to be back in the day that this mainly just fell to maybe dad in the household. Uh, now in a lot of households, there's combined incomes, and, and, and with that comes a lot of challenges and, 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 and a lot of conversations, okay? And I can't tell you how many times over the years, like just as a pastor talking to a couple, one or the other will say, you know, they work too much, and I wish they'd spend more time with the family. And then that particular person says, well, I work so much so I can provide money for our family. And there's always a tension that's created with that. Okay? And that's why we do this in light of eternity. So it's important to provide for our families, but not so much that we lose sight of why we're actually doing it and that we lose sight of eternal purposes. A warning from Scripture, Mark 8, 36. What would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? 
Maybe the application is, what does it profit us if we gain a lot, but we lose our family in the process? And so if you're driven, if you're ambitious, if you like earning for your family, praise God, but make sure you're doing it in a way where you have eternity in mind, that there are eternal consequences to how we actually go about doing that. But rest assured, that's one of the blessings that God gives us when it comes to the money that he's entrusted us with, okay? So it's good to remember that. While we're here on earth, that we, we use the money to provide for our families. We do that with eternal purposes in mind. Let me give you the second thing that happens on this side of eternity. We can invest in eternal purposes. So here on earth, provide for our families, absolutely. But then also recognize we get to invest in eternal purposes. We've talked a lot about that in this series, that when we give to the things of God, when we return the full tithe to God through our local church, when we give to other organizations, when we give to advance the gospel, we're giving to eternal purposes. And there's a passage, it's one of Jesus's, again, like profound teaches on money. I have not talked about it in this series. It's a little longer. But in this passage, Jesus is giving us some pretty amazing truths to hang on to. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Listen to what Jesus says. Do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermins destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermins do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, Jesus is reminding us, and we know this, you can't take it with you. Spend all your money on treasures on earth, things, possessions, none of that stuff gets to go with you. It's going to rust. Animals are going to get in and eat it. I don't know how that works, but that's what Jesus says happens, right? Moths get in, they eat your clothes. Not sure how that works, but it happens. The famous oil baron, John D. Rockefeller, way back in the day, when he passed away, it was kind of like a, a big story back then. How much money did he leave as an inheritance? And finally, like a newspaper reporter was able to you know, get an interview with someone from his family and this particular person had been left um, to execute like all the finances and they were kind of a financial planner with all that. And so the newspaper reporter famously asked him, how much did Mr. Rockefeller leave? And the person responded, all of it, all of it. And it's a reminder that regardless of how much you've accumulated in this earth, you can't take it with you. That's what Jesus is saying. But here's the other thing Jesus is saying. You can send it ahead of you. So you can't take your money with you. Jesus says you can send it ahead of you. How does that work? Jesus says by storing up for yourselves treasure in heaven. That when you invest the money you've been entrusted with for eternal purposes, in some way this has treasure that waits for you in heaven. You say, how does that work? I don't know. I haven't been to heaven yet, okay? We don't get somebody to come back and tell us tangibly what that looks like, but Jesus said it. I believe it. It's true. So when you use the money for eternal purposes, Jesus says there's treasure in heaven. But here's what's really interesting. He says you're storing up for yourselves treasure in heaven. It's almost like Jesus is giving wise investment counsel. He doesn't want us to misuse money here in light of eternity, which is going to be much longer. And he says there's an opportunity to store up treasure for yourself. And so, again, how does that work? Maybe in this series you've kind of had some things sparked about how you could use the money. Maybe you're young. You don't have a lot of money. You can still use it for kingdom purposes. I mean, last week we talked about Compassion International the ministry that they do. There's Christian institutions, there's mission organizations, there's local ministries here beyond just Vaughn Forest Church that you can use money to advance the gospel. And Jesus says, you're storing up for yourself treasure in heaven. One of the things that I've kind of gotten into over the last decade, and I'm kind of embarrassed to say that I didn't recognize how big of a need this was until about 10 years ago, is these organizations that are translating the Bible in languages that people can understand. I guess I just wrongfully assumed that that had already happened. But did you know there are literally people all over the world, the Bible has yet to be translated in their language. And there's organizations, this is their entire mission. I've got a friend who lives in Cameroon as a missionary. He's been there for about 20 years, and the people who he serves in Cameroon, there's about 40,000, and Cameroon, like a lot of nations, is not one nation speaking one language. It's one nation made up of multiple ethnicities and people groups and cultures within that nation. And this particular group of about 40,000 people had literally never had someone give them an alphabet. Their entire language was spoken. And about 15 years ago, he actually codified an alphabet for them. So now they're actually starting schools and, 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 and writing books. You say, I thought that already happened all over the world. No, it's just happening. And, and within the last five years, he's already translated three books from the Bible into their language. This is the first time in the history 
of these people, they've been able to read God's word and not even all of God's word, just the books that he's translated so far. And these things compel my heart. And and, and when we recognize that there are gospel opportunities all over the world that we can invest some of our resources while we're here on earth for eternal purposes, that's exciting. And I hope that some of those things have sparked some things in you during this series. But see, here's the truth. All of us are going to eventually enter eternity, okay? That's just how it works. And again, our life is short. Eternity is long. But what I want to encourage you with with the rest of the message today is that there are some decisions that we can make while we are still on this side of eternity that will carry through in positive ways once we have entered into eternity, okay? So let me give you those two as well. So jot this down. Once we enter eternity, we can continue to provide for our families. Here's what I'm saying. When you pass on and you enter eternity, your family is still here. And if you are currently providing financial resources for your family, just because you're gone doesn't mean that they won't continue to need the resources. And this is something that you can begin to think through now so that you can continue to provide for your family even when you're not here. I love this verse, James 4.14. I actually just read this verse at a funeral. Interestingly enough, a couple weeks ago, you guys were here, I told a story about my Mima, my grandmother. She passed away the week after I told that story. So it's kind of pretty cool to think that the last Sunday she was here on this earth, like I told a story about her. And then she passed away and she's now with Jesus and she's having the time of her life. But I was able to do her funeral this past Tuesday and we had an amazing celebration of her life. And I read this verse at her funeral just as a reminder. I read this verse this morning just as a reminder. James 4.14, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. And life is short. And I'm going to sit on a stool here just for a moment. I've been here for a little over five months. I have yet to sit on a stool yet when preaching. One of the things you guys will learn about me is if I sit on a stool, it means I'm about to tell you something you don't like, okay? I don't know why I do that. It's just an old habit, all right? So I'm going to tell you something you don't like, tell you something you probably don't want to hear, maybe even disagree with a little bit of what I say and how I present it, but I want you to know my heart. If I tell you something that's hard to talk about, and if I tell you something that I know it'd be easier just not to talk about, that my only motivation is love, just as a pastor. My only motivation for saying this is because I care about you. You see, here's the thing. There's no such thing as an unexpected death. Death is challenging and difficult, and we're never prepared for it. But so many times we just block out some of the things that Scripture says about death and about our life. And I get it. But like that verse, thinking of our life as a vapor that's here today, gone tomorrow, it's not a fun verse to read. When we experience salvation in Jesus Christ, the promise of Scripture is that we will still have troubles. In fact, the best I can tell, Jesus tries to tell us that if we become a follower of him, we will have more troubles that there's still an enemy who is on this earth seeking to destroy you, everything about you, that this world is still full of sin and the devastating consequences of sin, whether it's sickness, whether it's illness, whether it's tragedy. And as long as we are here on this earth, that is our reality. This world is not our home. But so many times we just don't live like that's actually the case. And over the years, I have been surprised at how many fellow brothers and sisters in Christ I've talked to who don't have life insurance. And whether or not you agree with the merits of life insurance, can we all just say that we agree with insurance on some level if we own a car? Because if you own a car, they make you get auto insurance. I mean, if you take out a mortgage on a house, they won't let you keep that mortgage unless you also get homeowner's insurance. I mean, on some level, I think we all see the value of health insurance so that a medical emergency doesn't come along and and destroy our lives financially. And so insurance is one of those things that I think for the most part, we've all seen the value in. But here's what's really interesting about insurance. All of those policies I just listed, whether it's auto insurance, homeowner's insurance, health insurance, like you could pay money on those policies for years and not ever need them. And that's kind of a blessing, that if you invested that money and then nothing tragic happened and you never needed to use the policies, we wouldn't necessarily say that's a bad thing. 
But isn't it interesting, there's only one policy that you're guaranteed to need. And that's the life insurance policy. And nobody gets out of that one. That, that policy will actually come to fruition at some point. And listen, I'm not here to sell life insurance this morning. I'm not getting paid by anybody to sit up here and say this. What I am saying is that if you provide resources financially for someone and they are dependent upon you, you need to think through how you can continue to provide that for them once you're in eternity. And there's a verse from Scripture that we take seriously as a church, and I think every follower of Jesus should take seriously. James 1.27. James says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And we as a church have ministries that look after widows, ministries that care for children that have been orphaned in our community through foster homes and through foster parents and through promoting adoption. But the first place to apply this verse is in your own household. I mean, gentlemen, the moment you pass away, your wife becomes a widow. Gentlemen, the moment you pass away, you open up your children to the possibility of becoming orphans if, there are not, if your financial house is not in order. Ladies, if, if you are providing financially for your children, the moment you pass away, if you haven't prepared properly financially, you put them at risk of this verse becoming a reality in their life. And again, nobody likes to talk about these things, but it's really important that we do. And it's really important that we make wise decisions while we are still here on earth that will benefit those if we leave them. I mean, let's just use me for an example, okay? Like if I die this week, can I tell you what that would be? The greatest week of my life. You know why? I get to be with Jesus. I mean, Paul says it this way, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Here's what that means. As long as I'm living on earth, I'm gonna live for Jesus. But if I die, it's gain. If I die, it's better. If I die this week, I get to be in the presence of Jesus. Are you kidding me? All my pain and suffering has gone away. I no longer struggle with my sin nature. I am literally in the presence of Jesus. That would be the greatest week of my life. Let me tell you who would not be a good week for, my wife and three boys. Because I would no longer be here and they would be in pain, and they would be in suffering. And I can't tell you how many times over the years as a pastor, I've had to be around families who they couldn't even grieve the loss because of the financial stress that had immediately just been created. Because the person who had passed hadn't taken the time to set all of those things up. And so I wanna make you a little bit uncomfortable this morning, but I'm doing it hopefully in a way that you feel loved. Because you see, we can make decisions now that even when we are in eternity, the people who we've left behind, they know that we love them. They know that we cared about them. We know, they know that we set some things up for them. And so if that's kind of where you're at and that's something you haven't done, I'm not coming down on you, but I am challenging you, okay? This is an opportunity coming out of this series to do some of those things, okay? Now let's talk about something that's a little bit more exciting, okay? Once we enter eternity, here's the fun part, we can continue to invest in eternal purposes, we can continue to invest in eternal purposes. Jot that down. Once we are in eternity, what does that mean? That even after we are gone, the money that we were entrusted with while we were here on earth could still be used to advance the kingdom. Now, this is something that I've only recently really learned about. It was something that I had often wondered about, but I didn't really have any clarity on. And just recently, I've been able to get some clarity on that. And and let me tell you how that's happened. My wife and I, over the last three months, like we've been working through this. We've been working through how we can manage financial resources now so that when one or both of us enter eternity one day, the resources can continue to be used to be a blessing to our children, but also be a blessing to the kingdom. And thankfully, we were able to have a, a, a local ministry through our Alabama Baptist Foundation can come alongside us and help us with this. This is something we always knew we needed to do, and we'd done a little bit of it, but we've moved around a lot, and the last time we'd looked at it, we only had one son, and he was really little, and now we got three sons, and we just needed to kind of get some things in order. And so we've had a Christian attorney who's been walking us through this process, free of charge, free of charge, and it's been incredible. And one of the things that we've seen is that beyond taking care of our children, we also have the opportunity to set aside some of our financial resources that could be invested in the kingdom, whether it's through a local church, whether it's through a ministry organization that we're passionate about. And again, this is something that I had often wondered about, but I'm just now seeing the opportunity 
in it. And let me tell you why this matters to me. Okay, I'm not trying to say that this is why this should matter to you, but personally, let me just get personal with you for a second. Because you see, I actually believe that Jesus is gonna return one day. Maybe, maybe it does happen while we're still here on this earth, but for most of us, we're probably gonna see him upon our death in heaven, but Jesus is gonna return. It's one of the mysteries of scripture. We get clarity here and there. We get questions answered here and there. And anytime you want your church attendance to go up, do an end time series. People love that, right? It's fun to talk about. But Jesus talked about it one day. He said a lot of things. And the disciples were trying to figure out, what does he mean by that? And and in the middle of all the stuff Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 25, about the end of times, there's a sentence, there's a verse, a statement that he says that truthfully over the years, I think it's just been kind of glossed over. And it's easy to miss the significance of it. But this verse is what compels my heart with what we're talking about this morning. Matthew 24, 14. Here's what Jesus says. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. I don't know how all that works, but I know what Jesus said. And what he said is that the gospel needs to be proclaimed everywhere, and then the end will come. That has not happened. There are unreached people groups all over the world. And by unreached people groups, I don't mean people who have heard the gospel but not responded. I mean people who have literally never heard the name of Jesus mentioned. That all over our world today, the seven billion people who are alive, created in God's image, Jesus hung on a cross for their sins as well. They have literally never heard. There are other parts in the Bible where we are told that God is patient in sending Jesus to return so that more people won't perish and spend an eternity separated from him. We are compelled by the Great Commission, to take the gospel message to the ends of the earth. But church, can I be honest with you? I don't think that task will be completed in my lifetime. There's far too much work left to be done. I think it's gonna be completed in my children's lifetime, perhaps my grandchildren's lifetime. But here's the opportunity that I think I've been given. I can help fund that. I can help fund that. See, the way I see it, doing ministry isn't getting cheaper. The way I see it, spreading the gospel message 50 years from now will be more expensive than it is today because of all the technology that's being developed. And the way I see it, church, we have been given opportunities, those of us who have been entrusted with financial resources, to, to set it up in a way where once we are actually enjoying all of eternity with Jesus, some of the money that we've been entrusted with is being used by our children. It's being used by our grandchildren through missions organizations, through local churches, through Christian institutions to see the completion of this verse that Jesus spoke that day. That's compelling to my heart. And as my wife and I have sat down and worked through this together, we've had a lot of crazy, incredible conversations about what the future could look like for our boys, about what the future could look like for the church, about what the future could look like when it comes to advancing the gospel message. And I wanted to make that opportunity available to you as well, okay? So on your connection card today, there's a next step about an upcoming estate planning workshop, Wednesday, March 4th, 6 p.m., okay? This is what we've been going through. And all this is is an opportunity to come and kind of hear from the individuals that have been helping us Share. And, and, and when they first asked me about this, I said, well, you know, I need to do something like that. And I'd like to kind of see, you know, what it's like, because I'll just be real with you guys for a second. You know, maybe we won't post this part online. I always think somebody's trying to sell me something. Okay, I just do. So I was like, I'm not going to talk to people in our church about something if this is some kind of like used car sales, hey, show up for this, but it really was about that. You know, are we buying Amway? What's going on? Like, I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't like that, and it's not. It's been free of charge. There's been no, you know, pressure. It's been a service that my wife and I are grateful. And so who's that for? Who's this for, this workshop? If you're a married couple and you've just started having kids, I would encourage you to come. That you need to begin to think through what that's gonna look like. Maybe you're here and you've got older kids and you did something like this. You, you, maybe you created a will years ago, but your kids are older and it doesn't really fit kind of the season of life you're in now. Maybe you're here and all of your kids are grown and gone and raising their own kids and, and you're sitting there and, and you have some abundance. Last week I talked about a guy who's had a harvest. He had more crops than he needed. Jesus didn't say that was bad. Jesus just said the way he handled it wasn't good. Maybe you've got more crops than you need. Maybe you've got an abundance. And that's a blessing, but it's also a burden because you're thinking through what would happen with that if something happened to me. This is a must attend for you because it will give you the opportunity to put some things in motion 
where, of course, your family can be taken care of, but you also can see the opportunities. An opportunity for you to fall on your knees before the Lord and say, Lord, have you entrusted me with more so that your kingdom could be advanced beyond my lifetime? See, I think the more believers who begin to think this way, the more quickly we can advance the gospel message. And so no pressure, just simply an opportunity. If you want to come, if you want to attend, if you want to receive some guidance about that, if you even have more like specific questions like, well, what does that mean? Hang out in the lobby, come find me, and I'll be happy to answer those for you. But see, here's the thing. All of this, all of this, using money for eternal purposes in the here and now, using money for eternal purposes in the here and now for all of eternity is only possible because of what Jesus did. It's only possible because of what Jesus did. That Jesus went to the cross for you, for me. Jesus defeated death through the resurrection, which is why we can talk about death so casually. It's, not, it's nothing to be feared. If you're a follower of Jesus, you pass from this life to the next, and you're with him for all eternity. That's because of what Jesus did. And I mentioned my grandmother earlier. I got to speak at her funeral this past Tuesday. My grandmother was an amazing woman, amazing woman. Her life affected many. She did some pretty incredible things in her life that I don't have time to go into I did that in her eulogy. But at the end of her eulogy, because there were people who were sitting there listening to me talk about my grandmother, I wanted to make sure that they heard this. And you're sitting here this morning, I wanna make sure you hear this. My grandmother was a great woman, but none of that is what got her into heaven. Like when, when she appeared before God a little over a week ago and he said, why should I let you in? Her answer was not because of all of the good things she did while she was here on earth. And sadly for many of us, and kind of the culture of the Bible Belt that we live in, that narrative still has taken root. That we actually think that the things that we do, which are wonderful things, somehow set us up to be good in the eyes of the Lord. And what we are told by Jesus, our Savior, is that's simply not possible, which is why he came. That if there was anything that we could do that would make us good enough to be good enough for God, Jesus didn't have to come. And if there was somebody who I could hold up to you that in my opinion would be good enough, it would have been my grandmother and she wasn't good enough. But because she placed her faith in Jesus Christ, she is now celebrating all eternity with Jesus Christ. It would be very sad for you to come through the message today, come through this series, learn a few things about money, but have never established a relationship with Jesus Christ. Ultimately, that is what gets you eternal life. And we're gonna partake of communion here in just a few moments. And communion is our way of being reminded of what Jesus did for us. That when Jesus went to the cross, he shed his blood. We drink the cup to remember that. That when Jesus went to the cross, willingly, he offered up his body to be broken as a sacrifice for us. We eat the bread to remember that he made that sacrifice for us. So if you're here today and you have experienced salvation, if you're a follower of Jesus, in just a few moments, you're gonna have the opportunity to partake of communion. If you are here today and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, communion is not for you because you have nothing to commemorate. Communion is just a story of something that someone did a long time ago, but it's not for you because you've never gotten to a place in your life where you've admitted admitted your own personal need for a Savior. You've never gotten to a place in your life where you've recognized there's nothing I can do to get this gift. It's free. I simply have to receive it. It requires dying to yourself. It requires laying aside your pride. It requires admitting your sinner in need of a Savior. But here's the thing. I'd love to see you partake of communion. I'd love to see you in just a few moments pray to receive Jesus Christ so that with other brothers and sisters in the room, you too can partake of communion this morning. Would you bow your head with me as we pray together? If that's you this morning, don't delay. Don't delay. The possibility of eternal life is made available to you through Jesus Christ. All you have to simply do is say, Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross for me. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I'm gonna live for you for the rest of my life. You prayed that prayer where you're seated here this morning. Communion's available for you as a way to celebrate what Jesus did for you. Maybe you're here this morning and you prayed that prayer a long time ago. You know you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It just feels a little distant right now. Many times communion is our way of receiving the blessing of reducing that distance, of remembering what Jesus did for you and focusing on that relationship once again. And so we, Jesus, we thank you that you've given us eternal life. We thank you that you've made that possible through your sacrifice on the cross. We thank you that death is not to be feared because you defeated it through the resurrection. And Lord, we thank you that we even have the opportunity to think about money eternally. It's incredible. All because of you. 
So Lord, as we enter into this time of communion, meet us where we're at. Lord, for some of us, that's meeting us for the first time as new followers of you. Lord, for some of us, it's meeting us and getting us back on the path to walk with you. And so Lord, during this time, do what you can do. Do what you need to do. Do what only you can do. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, our team is gonna begin to lead us. And as they do, there are communion stations all over the room that you feel free to make your way to as you feel led. So let's all stand together as our team begins to lead us this morning.